Chat with Traders, episode 89. This is your key to the minds of trading's elite performers, those who profit in relentless markets. Here on the Chat with Traders podcast, you'll hear about the skill sets and tactics that lead winning traders to win so you can level up and become a better trader. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. Okay, we've got a new sponsor starting this week, so I'd like to introduce Tradovate. Tradovate is essentially a futures broker who doesn't charge commissions. Instead, Tradovate charges customers a flat rate starting at just $39 a month for an unlimited number of trades. Tradovate also combines technology into their offering by providing a modern cloud-based platform with many advanced features for futures traders at no additional cost. Everything you need to trade is bundled together, resulting in serious savings. To learn more and get a free two-week demo, simply visit tradeovate.com forward slash traders. Now, Tradeovate is spelt T-R-A-D-O-V-A-T-E, tradeovate.com forward slash traders. Hey, traders, what's good? Nice to have you listening to episode 89. Now, let me introduce this week's guest, Blake Morrow, also known as Pipsar on Twitter. Blake started out as a stockbroker in 1995, but this only lasted for a short period of time before he switched teams to become a trader. A wealthy friend put up $50,000 in starting capital, which Blake lost around about $30,000 of it within the first six months. Though, before wiping out entirely, Blake was able to turn that remaining $20,000 into roughly $1.5 million in the next few years that followed. He's since been involved in various trading and technology firms, but today, Blake is the chief currency strategist for WiseTrade, co-founder of Forex Analytics, and most importantly, an independent FX trader. Over the course of this episode, you'll hear about Blake's story in greater detail, how he navigates Forex markets using charts and technical analysis, as well as an understanding of economic drivers, some tips for beginning traders using leverage, and plenty more too. So here we go. I'm Aaron Fifield, and you're listening to Chat with Traders featuring Blake Morrow. Um, I'm excited about this because it's been a very a slow day to say the least. I mean, the, the, this is like the worst week to be in the markets uh, aside from, um, you know, the, the, the time between Thanksgiving and Christmas, especially that last uh, couple of weeks. So. so why is it so slow? It's just, you know, lack of liquidity. You got a lot of uh, European traders are gone. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of North American traders. This is their last week of holiday before their, um, we have a Labor Day weekend here in the U.S. So things are, uh, you know, it's a long weekend. So everybody usually uh, wraps things up after Labor Day weekend. And then, you know, it takes a good week or two to get things back in the flow because you get you, you get a lot of hedge fund managers you know they come back uh on the 5th of september or 6th of september and then they have weeks of meeting a week of meetings you know trying to strategize and uh liquidity starts to pour back in after that so you know it's just everybody's wrapping up their summers so and everybody knows it's typically a slow time of the year okay so i mean even though like forex you know everyone kind of refers to it as the most liquid markets in the world when a lot of people go on holiday do you do you still kind of have an effect like that? Like, does it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, 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 how do you change your trading to kind of work with that? Well, that's an interesting question. It's usually, uh, it's usually actually just making sure your stops are a little closer. Um, I pick up my my position size uh, sometimes. It depends on the the environment, though. Um, you know, sometimes I'll. If if the ranges like today, the ranges were a little bigger, so I uh, I, I I narrowed my 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 trade sizes a little bit, widened my stops a bit, and, and kind of let the trends take hold best they could. Uh, some days when I know there's a 30 pip trading range and there isn't much, I just uh, I'll keep a tight stop and I might even actually take a little bit bigger position. So instead of trying to make, I don't know, 30 pips or 50 pips in a trade, I might only look to make 10 or 15, but a little bit bigger position will compensate for, you know, some of that lack of liquidity. Yeah, right, right. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, Blake, well, let's just get, let's just get started. I mean, I can't remember if I mentioned this to you beforehand, but um, I, I constantly get hounded by listeners to bring on more FX traders. So, I just want you to know you're probably making a lot of people really happy right now. <laughs> oh, great. 
talk to us about your introduction to trading. Like, how'd you how'd you get into this? What was your intro? Wow, that's a that's a that's a, a you know a funny question that a lot of people always ask. Um, you know, it's especially where I live. I, I live in Phoenix, Arizona, so I'm not in the center of the financial universe. I'm not out in New York or I'm not out of Chicago here in the United States, where you know I, I'm probably more of a uh, you know more of a I guess, a, a normal trade, I guess, uh, if you will. And uh, so when people ask me, like, how did you get into the currency market? It's always, it's always an interesting uh, question, and I've got, I've got a long-winded answer. But um, th- when I left the military, I, uh, I was in college, and I was going to school full-time and, and, and working my way through college. You know, I, had, I, was a, I was actually a doorman at a bar. You know, I was in my 20s. I was uh, uh, early 20s, and uh, I worked um, some retail during the during the afternoons, and then I'd I'd uh, go to school during the day and at nights. And um, you know, I had one of my best friends who was a stockbroker. And this is you have to think this this is back in the this is back in the mid 90s. He was a stockbroker, and he was kind of like the I don't want to say a boiler room type of. Uh, setting, but he he was a you know he got on the phone and dialed three four hundred people a day, and it was just a numbers game. But he'd get people on the phone and sell them stock, and um, and he's like, you know, Blake, you got the gift of gab. You should try being a stockbroker. And, and I said, eh, I don't know anything about the stock market. And, you know, it's not really my interest. He goes, it doesn't really matter. You know, you, you can you can you can you can talk and you can probably sell. You should try it. He was making a lot of money at the time, especially me being in college. And I saw the car that he was driving and the lifestyle he was living. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'll go in for an interview. And I did. And, um, and, uh, I I got the job. I didn't know anything about the markets. I got the job. I, I went and got my series seven and, you know, my, my state license, which was a 63 at the time. I think it still is anyway. Um, and I became a stockbroker and, I didn't really. I did it for 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 uh, over a year, or about a year, and I I really wasn't too happy with selling people stocks uh, over the phone. I I was good at it, and uh, you know we 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 brought Pixar public. We were part of that public offering, which was pretty neat. Um, so my clients did well, but it wasn't. It it, it just. It just it wasn't something that really interested me, and and fortunately that, that same guy he had learned how to trade from a market maker. They brought a company public back in the '90s called GoToNet, and he sat with the market maker for like a couple of months straight. And this market maker really taught him, you know, uh, you know, order flow and you know uh, uh, d- d- depths of the market and how to navigate through them. And, he uh, uh, that was right at the time that 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 the day trading in the United States was getting really on its feet, and um, Jeff Burke and Chris Block of Block Trading they were on the front cover of Inc. Magazine, and um, you know they were called the the Bad Boys of Trading or the So's Bandits. I forget exactly what what the the title was. They were on the front cover, and we we had a mutual friend who was extremely wealthy uh, in the insurance industry, and uh, he was a friend of he was a friend of uh, he was the, the the boyfriend of a woman I knew, and so we approached him uh, with this you know magazine article and saying and you know, we told him hey we can we can do this whole trading thing it should be easy so uh, <laughs> of course it's always easy and it was in 1996 and we uh, we went to the same offices that those guys were uh, written up in. They're, they're called block trading. They had an office in Houston and Dallas. They had one in Scottsdale, Arizona. And so we went in the Scottsdale office in, in, in the mid-90s and um, started trading there. And, and I, I, I really, uh, so funny, I, when I first started trading, it, it, I started with a certain amount of money. Uh, and <laughs> within the first six months, within the first six months, I think I lost like 60% or close to 70% of the equity. Now, keeping in mind that as a trader, you you live off the market. It's not like I'm drawing a salary or anything. And uh, I, I really struggled that first few months and to, and, and, and eventually um, found my wings. You know, over the next several years, I, I um, traded my myself in a, a nice, prosperous position where I left my investor. Uh, I also partnered up with a couple other traders. One of the, one of the, one of the, um, principals at that block trading office in uh, Scottsdale. He uh, moved with us. We all moved to Dallas and we opened our own brokerage firm. And um, we had a license 
at the time, NASD and SEC, uh, you know, licensed firm, and we had our own day trading operation. So back in the the late '90s, you know, even into you know the early 2000s, the technology wasn't as as it is today. I mean, internet was still in its somewhat infancy. People didn't have high speed internet in their homes. Um, you know, when I downloaded my charts, I used <laughs> back in the '90s. I used to download them, you know, via a, you know a telephone uh, cable, and it would take like hours to download like 200 charts. It was ridiculous. But at that point in time, there were a lot of day trading offices. So we had our own office, and um, and so we had. We had, I think, at our at our peak, we had about fifteen or eighteen traders that were in our office, and all you know from all different walks of lives, and really, really great traders that I I learned a lot from. And um, uh, eventually, you know, we sold our we had a technology company that was spun off from that brokerage firm that built direct access to trading technology, and uh, we sold that company to the Wise Trade Group uh, in two thousand. Three, I think it was early 2003, and so I've been with the Wise Trade Group ever since, and that's where I really got my 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 you know my trading my trading started, and and I lived off the markets for many years, uh, just solely um, in the 90s and early 2000s um, trading. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, that's a really great story, Blake. And I'd just like to backtrack a little bit to sure. Once you left the brokerage, uh, you said you went into went on to block trading. So block trading was that a prop firm? I take it. Mm-mm. No, excuse me. That was just drinking some coffee here. It was. Uh, it, it's actually. It, it was a. Uh, we didn't. They didn't have prop firms. They were all independent traders, kind of like the firm that we had in Dallas. So you you would have like let's say um, let's say an individual like uh, yourself or myself, and 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 I had let's just say you had 50, 50 grand, and you wanted to start day trading. Well, back. Back in the 90s and even in the early 2000s, regulations were pretty lax where we used to have some major leverage. It was um, uh, the leverage you could have trading the equity markets was much different than, um, you know, in the mid 2000s, maybe late, you know, I, I forget what years it was. It was probably 2007 or eight or nine. Um, they, they, Changed the, the 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 leverage that day traders had. You, know, you used to you, you never you didn't have back then. You didn't have to have twenty five thousand dollars in your account to be able to have day trading margin. Um, you could and the margins that we had were incredible. It was like you know twenty to one or maybe even greater than that. And so with a you know. Fifty thousand dollar account, a hundred thousand dollar account, or in our case, that we you know we had accounts that were you know in the half million dollar range at that time. Uh, we could trade whatever we wanted and as much as we wanted. I mean, I would trade five, six, eight thousand shares of Yahoo at a time, and uh, it, you know I never ran into any type of margin issues. So we, a lot of individual traders would go there. There were, I'm sure there was, there were certain prop. Firms, uh, I, I just wasn't aware of them. Uh, block trading was more of an independent traders would would go there, and uh, like I said, we didn't we didn't trade from home. No one really traded from home because we didn't have the technology. So everybody would go to these trading offices where we'd all share ideas, and 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 uh, we all had the the the, uh, the the speed to be able to trade from there. Okay, yeah, right. That makes sense. That's really interesting, and. You know, you mentioned your your wealthy friend helped you out with uh, capital in the beginning. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it would be nice if we all had uh, a wealthy friend like that. But um, <laughs> was he hesitant to hand his money over? Yeah, you know, it, it, he was. Uh, he was, but he also, uh, if I could, if I could explain to you the, the 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 kind of person this guy was, he was he lived a pretty lavish lifestyle. Style. You know, he had exotic animals and exotic cars and exotic girlfriends, for that matter. Uh, so I think he was probably more of the risk taker, you know, type of person. And um, but he was he was he was very uh, street savvy. And one of the things that he did, I remember when he first when we first opened our accounts, and you had to have like a long account and a short account because you couldn't the way that the 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 um, the back office worked back then. That's what you had to do. Um, 
I remember when we first got the accounts open, he goes, he goes, all right, here's a book. And, uh, and, and, and it was the, uh, it was the Mark Douglas, the disciplined trader. That was like the first book that I ever read on trading. And, and fortunately, um, it's the, the late Mark Douglas, if you don't know him. I, I've known him personally. I actually work with him on a couple of projects um, maybe about seven or eight years ago. He's one of the, was one of the, the, the premier trading psychologists uh, uh, and wrote many books on trading psychology. But I remember I got this book, The Disciplined Trader. And then he, uh, he also um, uh, signed me up to be coached with uh, several different traders, uh, a, a, another trading psychologist, two, two technical traders, um, where I learned really my skill set of how to, how to read and, 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 and analyze the markets using Fibonacci's at that time. And, uh, and, and that was a really... Those those stepping stones, I, I didn't really think about it so much at the time, but looking back, that was probably, you know, what really set me off in the right direction was really understanding um, how to look at charts, um, how to analyze them, and 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 identify where proper entry points were and those types of things. And uh, but he was, you know, to answer your question, he was he was pretty nervous at, at first, but he also took what I feel were the proper steps at that point to, 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 to get us, you know, where we needed to be and be profitable. Okay. And, and was he incentivized in any way? Like, did he take a, a split oh, yeah. of the profits? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we split the profits. We had a, we had a percent um, sharing plan, of course. Okay. So how did he react when you lost, you know, between 60 to 70% of that capital he had handed over? Well, you know, when that when that happened, and, and keeping in mind, I think I was about twenty six or twenty seven at the time. Uh, he was, you know, this wasn't a large amount of capital for him, so he didn't really think about it a whole lot. Uh, he had confidence in me, and the 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 funny thing is, um, over the course of the next, uh, I, I guess, over the course of the next um, two and a half years, because of the time. Now you have to imagine the time that time in the. The, the mid to late 90s was the internet dot com boom, if you will. And so we ended up doing really well. We had a, a lot of positions in some smaller internet name stocks that ended up blowing up and really kick started my trading career. Um, so he ended up doing extremely well. But at that point in time, you know, he, he knew. He's like, you know, listen, you're, 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 you're new. And you're you're going to get this. And he also knew that that I it was more of a you know I, I, if I'm going to eat and I'm going to survive, I'm going to make it work. And I and I told him I'm like I'm going to make this work. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make this work. And he had the confidence in me. And uh, I think really what turned it around at that point is my my uh, trading partner. He had his own account, but you know, his guy that actually got me into being a stockbroker at that point in time. He really was the driving force behind me, you know, sitting me down and saying, listen, you know, we have to be disciplined in how we trade. You know, it's not just throwing darts. We have to really, you know, start to analyze the markets and understand where, you know, entry points are and what your risk is. And, and all the things that I really wish I would have learned, you know, right at the very beginning. And it, and it took me some time to, to, to learn some of the things that I, I try to teach traders in today's today's trading world yeah okay and just before we move on to this to talk more about your actual turning point i'm just interested to know like how were you paying your bills how are you eating and and keeping up with expenses um (laughs) during that during that period when you were starting out and you lost like you mentioned 60 to 70 percent of your capital how were you getting by well, fortunately, I was uh, I, I I was always really good with my money as far as you know squirreling away for for a rainy day. So, I I I lived a lot on uh, ramen noodles and peanut butter and bread, <laughs> and uh, uh, fortunately, I had a I had you know a, a, I was in I was in um, my my mother had a uh, she had moved she had moved to Sacramento, California at the time to take on a. A contractor position, and she had this rental property, which is over by uh, our local university here in Phoenix. 
and uh, and it, it it's it's definitely nothing to write home about. But it's it, it's you know a lot of college students were around there as well. So I I got to live there not rent free, but uh, she was pretty lenient if I was running a little behind. So but those stresses mounted. Those were really stressful times, and 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 those are those are times where you know really the the market. And this is where you have to dig down really deep as a trader. You have to, you have to really, uh, it's where your strength comes from is through those trying times. And I, I'm, I'm really, I feel fortunate that I had to go through some very tough times early in my career to really make sure I could turn it around. And, and it, cause you know, in retrospect, you realize, man, I never want to put myself back in that situation. Um, but also it, you know, helps you really dig deep and, and, and really, um, figure out what you need to do to be successful in the markets. And, and I, I was one of those people that, you know, West Coast trading for us in the United States, especially where I live, you know, the markets were opening at 6.30 in the morning. That means I was up at 4.30 and, and, and at the office by 5.30. And, the off, and then, then, you know, the market opens at 6.30, closes at 1.00. But I would still be in the office for for hours on end afterwards, looking at charts, analyzing the markets, trying to figure out what I wanted to do the next day. And I think a lot of that drive came from I, I really needed to feed myself and and put put you know put food on the table and and make this work. Yeah. So essentially, like you, you almost feel as though you wouldn't have become as successful as a trader as you are today if it wasn't for those tough situations in the beginning where it was kind of like um, do or die. Absolutely. And, you know, I think uh, one of the, uh, it's the I, I, I agree with you. And, and one of the things that I, I try to explain to traders now is, you know, make sure you have enough money set aside. If, if you really want to trade for a living, make sure you have enough money set aside so you don't have to deal with some of those stresses. Um, because, you know, depending on where you're at in your 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 at your life, at what point you're at in your life, you can you maybe take some of those risks. But you know, if you have a family, if you have a wife, if you have kids, it's much harder to take those types of risks. I, I'm I'm glad that I went through those experiences when I was young, and I didn't have a family and I didn't have kids, and I was I, I could take on those risks. Um, I wouldn't have done it any other way. But you know, it, for for traders that are starting out. And they're trying to, you know, just, 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 you know, become successful. Getting rid of some of those risks are probably, are probably really important as you start your, your journey as a trader, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, let's focus in a little more on your actual turning point as a trader. So, you'd obviously gone through a pretty rough patch. What happened in order for you to go from a losing trader to a profitable trader? You know, a, a lot of it. First of all, I would say is is a little bit of luck. At that point in time, like I said, we uh, we took a couple of positions and um, they ended up doing really well, which gave me a little bit of cushion. So that that obviously helped quite a bit. After that, it was more about discipline. It was more about discipline and and realizing that I needed to wait for a certain setup to evolve. Uh, I got caught. Just like a lot of people at that point in time, and even traders, I, you know, here I am, twenty years later, and I watch traders trade the markets. Everybody gets caught up in the 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 inertia of the market at that moment, and and the excitement, and they chase prices all over the place. Um, they think, oh, a move is happening. I've got to be on it. And by the time they get in it, it's already too late. The markets have turned. So what I realized early on, and and one of the things that's really been the, I would say the backbone of my trading, has been being patient and waiting for the market to set up. Um, that has taken me so so far in the markets. And it's one of the things that I think that if I would have learned early on, I wouldn't have been put in the situation that I was put in initially. Um, I, cause, cause at that time, Aaron, you have to realize that there wasn't, there wasn't traders education wasn't like abundant and the internet wasn't abundant at that point in time either. You couldn't just search anywhere for, Oh, what is a good chart pattern? And Oh, you know what, what does it take to be a successful trader? There just 
weren't that many web pages available. There wasn't the, those types of resources. So a lot of what I did at that point in my life was trial and error, um, and 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 based off of what I've you know the, the the few books that I read at that point. But I think really the turning point was the discipline, the discipline in in actually waiting, realizing that. I didn't have to be trading every second of every day and realizing that I needed to let a trade come to me. And if the trade came to me and I could plan around what it looked like, I could realize, okay, where is my stop going to be? At what point am I wrong? And where am I looking to get out? And what does my risk reward look like? Risk reward was one of those concepts that I, that I, fortunately picked up very early in my career and realized that, hey, if I'm going to risk a dollar, I, I need to make two or three or four or more, you know, and, 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 and if I'm going to risk that dollar, I need to make sure that that is the maximum amount of risk I'm willing to take in, in that trade. And those are the types of um, things that really got me to where I'm at today and th- those, those basic rules. Okay. So, so for you to increase your the amount of discipline you had as a trader, I mean, what specifically were you doing to to increase that discipline? Was it just a matter of being a lot more self aware of what you were doing? Um, was there any sort of practices or, or di- things you tried to do to actually increase your discipline and you know sit on your hands? <laughs> that's a I'm <laughs> that's a great question, and I'm glad you asked that because fortunately I had. A, uh, my 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 best friend, even to this day, is uh, I, I just actually had beers with him last week. Uh, he, the guy that really got me into the industry and, and taught me how to trade, he is still to this day. Even though he's not in the industry, he still is a very he does trade from time to time, and he calls me up and says, "Hey, you know, what do you think about this?" And I'm thinking about shorting that and that type of thing. So he, he dabbles in the market, even though he, he does other things now. Uh, Fortunately, I had him sitting next to me, and he was a an absolute drill instructor, if you will, like a military drill instructor. He would sit next to me, and he would smack me on the back of the head, saying, "What are you doing? You know, why are you doing that?" And uh, you know, if I was if I if I'd made a couple grand that day, he would pull he would he would literally unplug my computer as I was sitting at it. He'd say, "It's you're you're done." And he'd unplug my computer and make me go home, <laughs> so I didn't I didn't ruin the rest of my day, you know. And it might have only been eight o'clock in the morning, but those those little things that I can I could sit back and laugh at now, you know, now you know, uh, you know, years later, those are the those types of things really made a difference in in how I traded. And so fortunately, I had somebody that I could talk to. I guess the point I'm trying to make is I had uh, a companion, a trading partner, somebody who I trusted. Um, you know that I've I actually grew up with, that that really I could rely on him and ask you know hey what do you think about this and uh, I'm looking to buy this and he's like well w- why are you going to buy it there it just you know the the stock just moved it just moved ten dollars you know and 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 just this morning somebody was buying it ten dollars cheaper so here you are paying this ten dollar premium on the stock why would you do that I, you know I had somebody that walked me through the process. That we could talk, we could both, you know, banter back and forth, and that made a that made a huge difference in my career. And just to continue on that point, you know, when you're starting out, you don't necessarily know what's a good trade and, and what's a bad trade, or I don't know if that's the right way to frame it, but I think you you know where I'm heading with this. How were you able to kind of realize what worked and what didn't work so much for you? <sighs> Well, you can figure out what w- didn't work really quickly by your P and L. <laughs> so that was that was pretty that was pretty obvious. But um, you know, you know that, that that's a great question because I learned I learned from charts. I mean, I, I didn't come from uh, you know I wasn't an economics major. I wasn't somebody who you know was who prepared to enter the market through an Ivy League school education and, you know, made my way into the markets that way. I, I really learned through charts and charts was, were almost taboo at the time. It was um, kind of a, you know, now now charts are, seem like they're incorporated in everything that everybody does, no matter what they do in the markets. But at that time, it really wasn't. Um, and and so, the, the, the benefit that I learned is that utilizing a chart I could use historical price movements to help me identify where 
a possible entry point was, and I could actually know at what point I made a mistake. Now, as I have spent 20 plus years in the market, I've learned a lot about what what drivers move the markets, you know, especially being in the currency market now. When I, I made the switch uh, really back in 2003 to four, right around then is when I really stopped trading equities and went strictly into currencies. But one of the things that, or some of the things that I've picked up over the years is really learning uh, learning about what drives an instrument or an asset class um, from a, you know, whether it's a macro or micro perspective. And that um, has also helped me as far as my, 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 um, you know, entering, knowing when to enter the market. So I can, I can actually basically have a theme on what I'm trading and why and the direction I'm going and then find a technical point, point of entry, you know, based on uh, what I'd learned over the years. And so what I've, what I found though, just to answer your question, and I know I'm probably going in a circle here though, Aaron, what I learned is I didn't have to get really fancy with my analysis. The analysis that I do today is basically the same analysis that I did 20 years ago. And so for me, I learned more of a process. And once I found the process that worked for me, you know, that I don't want to say it's a secret sauce, but something that, you know, you know, if I look for this fib level on this trend line, you know, crossed over with this trend line and this RSI, look, the probabilities are that, you know, more times than not, it's the trade's going to work out. And if I can put a, 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 a maybe some sort of macro theme behind what I'm trying to do, I'm just increasing those probabilities. And it really didn't take me too long, I want to say too long, you know, you know, a, a few years where I could figure out on a, on a chart, this is what I need to look for in order to have what I would consider a good shot of having a successful trade. And then, you know, it's interesting. What's more interesting is just like any, any trader, I would fall into the normal traps. You know, I would, I would uh, make a lot of money quickly. I get to, I get to my, my, my head would get too big. Um, then my risk management goes out the window. Then I take a big loss and then I have to take a step back. And what I always realized is I always went back to the same, you know, same setup that I had learned years ago and say, okay, well, when I see this, this, and this, that is, you know, that's 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 what typically will work for me. So I always go back to the basics, and um, and so now what I do more than anything is I just do the basics. I don't I don't try to I don't try to vary my process much. It my process always stays the same. Okay, that's that's a good answer. I like that. So let's let's go into this a little further, and then we'll probably get into some uh, specific. Yeah specifics about sure. uh, FX. So, I mean, just give us an overview of how you're trading today. Like, what are the type of opportunities that you look for and try to take advantage of? Can, can you can you ask me this question in September, like maybe mid-September? <laughs> <laughs> Late August is not the best time. <laughs> no, uh, um, uh, j- jokes aside, I mean, all the type of setups I I really try to do is I, I really try to match up just some basic technical indicators. I'm not doing anything fancy. And that's what I, uh, I, I, you know, I host a daily webinar and I've been doing it for 13 years now. And, and everybody knows when they, when they see my charts and they see what I'm talking about, my charts look the same. It doesn't matter if it was today or you saw that you haven't seen me for four years and you were popped on my webinar four years ago. You'd see the same charts and same indicators and same trend lines and everything looks exactly the same as it did four years ago or six years ago or eight years ago. So, um, you know, I, I typically will look for pullbacks. I, I, don't, I don't chase price. And that's one of the things that I learned the hard way, as I mentioned to you earlier. 
I learned the hard way early on is I never chase price. I always wait for prices to come to me. So in other words, I'm always looking for some sort of pullback. Uh, Fibonacci is a great tool because that tells you how deep a retracement is. And you know, obviously, the, the, the deeper the retracement is, the, the less likely a, a continuation of that trend is. So you know, I'm always looking for a 38% retracement or a 618, which is the golden fib that, uh, that, that really you know, produces the most you know, most, uh, I want to say, hits or, or, or retracements will come to those, uh, those prices the most. You know, if I can match them up with a, uh, what I'm looking for for an RSI or I'm looking for for a trend line, if I can match up those areas together, the more I can get to line up, the, the higher the probabilities are. And, and that's what, as a trader, I'm really more of a risk manager. You know, I'm, I'm managing risk and I'm trying to, I'm trying to, line up as many probabilities as possible in, in my direction at any given time. And so, you know, for a typical setup for me, it's like I'm looking for a pullback. I'm seeing if I can, if, if, it, if, if that pullback will pause somewhere where there's a general trend. I, I, I do look at correlations. Correlations at this time of the year, when there's less liquidity, they tend to be less reliable because you just don't have as much liquidity in the market. So if, you know, if, if somebody's buying gold today or, you know, that doesn't necessarily translate, I'm buying gold, so therefore I'm selling the dollar. You, you don't get those correlations as tight when there's not as much liquidity. But I do look at correlations. I look at the cross rate effect, meaning that if the euro dollar is doing something specific on a major cross, that's going to influence how I look at the rest of the euro crosses as well. So I can say, well, the euro dollar is really, really selling off today. So therefore, if I'm trading a euro cross, meaning like the euro New Zealand currency or the euro Canadian currency, I might be looking more as a short side trade in that because of the cross rate effect. So there, there are several different things that I might look for as a currency trader, but, but, but typically they're all the same things. It's kind of boring, but uh, you know, people always think that trading is some, some you know, glamorous thing, but I'm, I'm, it's really quite a boring process that I follow every day. Hold the thought team. Here's a quick word for a new sponsor of ours, Tradovate. Tradovate is a futures broker who are anything but traditional. As a Tradovate customer, you do not pay broker commissions. Instead, you pay one monthly subscription fee, a flat rate which starts from $39 regardless of how many positions you trade and how many contracts you trade. So it doesn't matter if you trade one contract in a given month or 1,000 contracts or more. The rate is the same. When you do trade with Tradevate, while you dodge broker commissions, it is worth mentioning you do still need to pay the exchange, NFA and clearing fees, just to be clear. Tradevate's inclusive proprietary cloud-based platform is included for no extra cost and has many robust features, including a depth of market module, charting tools, plenty of indicators, real-time quotes, simulated trading, and advanced order types, where orders are actually held at the exchange and not on your device or in your browser. So that's a really great benefit. To learn more about Tradevate and how you can reduce your trading expenses, visit tradevate.com forward slash traders and sign up for a free two-week demo. If you have any questions, just hit up their great support team at tradevate.com forward slash traders. And just so there's no mix up on the spelling, it's spelt T-R-A-D-O-V-A-T-E. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening. Now let's get back to the interview with Blake. Okay, so I asked this question to Nicola Duke, who I know is a good friend of yours, when she was on the podcast about Fibonacci's. So why do you think Fibonacci's work? Like, why is that something, why do you think that's something useful to, to watch for, especially the, the 61.8? Well, Fibonacci's are, is such an interesting um, concept. Uh, first of all, you know, Fibonacci's, Really go back to you know the the, the you know, mathematicians and and um, and 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 how we have come to the conclusion that almost everything natural has some sort of Fibonacci ratio attached to it. Whether you're talking about the distance from your 
your forearm to your wrist to the distance to your you know wrist to you you know your your pinky finger uh, the distance between your pinky finger to your pointer finger you know on a horizontal basis uh, to a leaf in nature or you know or or pretty much everything everything has like a Fibonacci equation and a number that that really correlates uh, and and what's interesting is that you can be translated into human emotion that's why when 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 everybody looks at a when everybody looks at a a, a move and they say okay you know uh, that was a strong move in the market and now we're getting a pullback a 50% pullback automatically uh, you know relates to somebody in their head subconsciously that that was a uh, now it's half off uh, that's it was it was it was so much more expensive but now it's half price you know if it's a 618 it's it's like a natural emotional response area for people. And so if you know that about traders and around about people in general, the the herd mentality can really be used to your to your benefit. And knowing those Fibonacci ratios really is where you know the herd mentality is meeting. So what why it becomes so important and so valuable in my opinion is when you can match up different Fibonacci's based on different viewpoints of the market. So I might be looking at the euro dollar uh, saying, okay, well, there's this big move from, you know, from, from 110 to 115 and, and it's pulled back to where we're at today at 111.50. Oh, great. You know, that, that's pulled back about, you know, uh, a 618 or maybe, you know, maybe, maybe 62%, you know, retracement. But then I can look at it from somebody who's on the short side saying, okay, I was short from here to here, from you know, 113 to, uh, 114 to 113, and it's extended itself 161% extension, and it's now gone so far where I've, I've almost have to take profits at this point, where I can get different Fibonacci ratios, whether it's a pullback or an extension, if I can get them to line up at a certain point, the more I can, the more what we call confluence, or clustering, the more Fibonacci's I can get to line up at a certain point, the more, uh, you know, I can argue that we're going to have a turning point, whether it's a bounce or it's a pullback from that specific area. And I, I, it's something that, you know, I've always found very fascinating, but I think it, it has more to do with the, the human emotion component behind the market than anything. And and as a trader, I try to capitalize on that. I always think I always think about I always think about, you know, the, this one simple concept when I trade the markets. When people are buying, I want to be the one selling it to them. When people are selling, I want to be the one who's buying it. So that's why when when there's a pullback in the market and 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 you know we just had a strong move higher or lower in the dollar if it's pulling back people are selling it they're just trying to get out they're rushing out the doors i'm looking at a strategic place to be a buyer and when people are rushing in to buy the dollar or sell the dollar they're just rushing in to get in i'm usually one i, I want to be the person selling it to them and so keeping that in mind that always keeps me thinking one step ahead of everybody else. And using Fibonacci's helps me strategically find those technical points on the chart that I think are going to be those turning points where, you know, it switches from being, you know, all the buyers coming in to the sellers coming in or vice versa. Okay. So you're pretty much using it as something like a, a read on the market psychology, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, trading is, is all about, is all about, you know, I know that that that's that's drawn a lot of uh, uh, computer algorithmic type of trading that are trying to beat the humans, so to so to speak, in the markets. But really, it all it all comes back down to you know human emotions and 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 what's driving it and understanding what's driving those emotions and at what tipping points that people get you know they get too antsy where they have to sell or they get they 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 feel like they need to rush in and buy. Kind of understanding what other people's positions are in the market and where they're coming from has really helped me a lot. It's kind of like, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard this before interviewing so many traders over the years, Aaron, you know, trading is like playing chess, but when I, when I play chess, I'm playing against a lot of very advanced people in the markets and, you know, they might be trying to 
think three or four steps ahead. I'm trying to think four or five steps ahead of everybody else. So you know, that's where a lot of these fibs come into place because I can I can look at the market and say, well, you know, if that was if they were if they were buying up here at 114 and here we are at 111, at what point do they get nervous and at what point do they need to feel like I need to get out here? This is my do or die. Well, as they start to exit the market, that's where I start thinking, okay, well. You know, as they're exiting, those masses are exiting. I want to start looking to be a buyer, and so I, I always try to take an approach that way. And then, you know, I mean, there's a lot that goes into it, obviously. But at that at that at that point, just saying, okay, if I want to be a buyer here, where's my where's my risk, and at what point do I need to get out and say I'm wrong? Because I will be wrong, and I'm and I am wrong quite a bit, just like every trader out there. But being able to manage your risk is also an equally important part of, of, of trading. Undoubtedly. So earlier you referenced the, the 618 Fibonacci yes. and, you, and you talked about how you'd like to see uh, a retracement to that level uh, when looking for an opportunity to buy a pullback. Um, how much variance do you give that level? Like I presume that you're not expecting that the price is going to pull up right on the scent or at that very level like how much variance do you give that level to say whether it's held or not that's a that's a great question i I, um levels are levels you know whether you're using a support level or a fibonacci or you know uh, some sort of horizontal resistance or or whatever or channel channel support resistance anything technical I have to look at it as a zone, you know, a zone, and I have to keep it in the context of what chart I'm looking at too. I do consider myself a fairly active day trader, but I also like to swing trade the markets, and I, I tend to take, you know, a lot of positions that I might be in for a day or two, you know, depending on the environment. Like this week, I tend to be a little bit more active just because the market's not giving me, you know, opportunities to sit in the market for several days at a time. So, but. The reason why I needed to make this point is because it depends what chart you're looking at, and you have to realize that every every level, you know, whether it's a fib level or a resistance or whatever it is that you're looking at technically, levels are meant to be broken and they're meant to be probed above and below. So you very rarely stop right on a, a fib, and and that's why I'm, I I always say that. You know, technical analysis is not, you know, you, you, you don't look for perfection. There's a lot of imperfections and there's a lot of, you know, error for judgment. You have to, you have to, to gauge for that. Um, so if there's like a 618 retracement and it's a, it's like, let's say we've, we've seen a multi week run higher in the euro and it's about ready to come down. Uh, or it's been coming down. Well, if if I see the six one eight it being at let's just say one eleven, I would expect that there would be a move below one eleven, maybe to one ten eighty, maybe one ten seventy. But I want to see how the price reacts around that around that Fibonacci. Um, you know how how buoyant are we? And and so that's when you start looking at you know. What what chart are you what chart are you actually referencing? If I'm a day trader, I might be looking at an hourly chart. I'll be looking for how do those hourly candles respond around that 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 level. You know, if I'm look if I'm a more of a if I'm going to take more of a swing or 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 position approach to the market, uh, I, I I start to look at the daily candle. Okay, are we going to close above or below it? You know, and and, and Japanese candlesticks have have proved to me to be such a valuable tool uh, in the markets because that the, 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 a Japanese candlestick and how you read that candlestick is how you read price action, especially for the day. Those daily candles are so important because it can tell you who's, who's, who got caught holding the bag today you know, uh, uh, in the markets, whether you're trading you know, an individual stock or you're, you're trading currencies or, or, or any instrument for that matter. Those candlesticks can tell you, you know, hey, there were buyers early on in the day. Um, somebody got caught, you know, buying early in the day, and by the end of the day, we closed at our lows. Those people that bought at the highs are probably going to be really nervous and selling tomorrow. So, understanding the the anatomy of a candlestick is uh, equally important. So, if you factor that in with some of the you know fib levels that you're you're dealing with, it can become a very value or a very powerful. Um, way of trading, especially when you're trying to time your your entries to get in or out of the markets. 
Okay. So you talked about the 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 oh, what was it the, the close of a candle and sort of the open the following day. Yeah. Do, are they still as important as they might be in like equity markets? Because um, you know, in FX, you're trading pretty much around the clock for what is it like six days a week? Is the open <laughs> and close is it still as important? It is. It really. It really is. I, I. I find it extremely valuable. Um. You'll notice that most most brokers that uh, that you use, whether you know, I know you're in you're in Brisbane, and and is, is that's correct, right? Yes. You're, you're okay. And you're in Brisbane, and and I know Australian traders that have their charts queued into their brokers closing at a New York close. So that means your daily candles probably closing at a five p.m., uh, uh, which was just just you know, uh, 40, 45 minutes ago, they would have that daily candle close no matter what part of the world they're in. European traders the same way. And, and the reason why so many brokers in the FX will use a North American close because it's the, it's the very end of the day for the world. So if, if you talk about, you know, where you live in Australia, whether you're talking, you know, in Australia or New Zealand, you guys really kick off the next calendar day, so North American traders really have the um, the the, um, the 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 closing price, and it's it's really important. And I've had so many European traders say, "Well, my 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 close my candle looks a little different," and their their brokers are closing at the London fix, let's say. And and I was telling them, you know, hey, try to find a broker that actually gives you a a, a a daily closing price or can close their, you know, has the option to close the candle at the New York close because that really, I think, is the most important if you're dealing with a 24-hour market. Mm. Yeah, I could see how that could um, get confusing, especially for, for newer traders. Um, now, just backing up a little bit, uh, you know, you started out your career as an equities trader and then later on, I think it was around 2002, 2003, you transitioned to trading Forex and you've been yeah. trading Forex ever since. I mean, was there anything that was particularly difficult to get used to when you were coming over to trading currencies and what was the appeal for actually doing so as well? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. And, 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 uh, and I'll tell you, Aaron, the, 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 the hardest part for me to understand at that point was, oh my God, the markets are open 24 hours a day. And, uh, realizing that I couldn't, uh, for, for so many years, I used to just say, okay, the market's closed. And, you know, and even, even back when I first started trading, there weren't pre market and post market trading. Uh, the market was closed, it was closed. It's like, okay, the day's over. And then they started doing pre and po post market trading. But that really just kind of kept you in the market with very illiquid situations for, for a couple hours at a time, like it is now. But, when when there was a 24 hour market it took a little bit of time to understand that you know wow okay uh it may be the evening here in the united states but you know things are rocking and rolling over in sydney and in hong kong and um and it took me a little bit of time to understand that there you know we we look for major overlaps in the market so you know when when the asian uh i would say you know the the the, the pacific area where you're at um when when the Asian markets overlap with the European markets, you get this you know massive amount of volatility, and then also when the European markets and the North American markets cross over, you get a massive amount of volatility, and then you get kind of get a dead time. Um, uh, it, it, it the liquidity kind of tapers off as as European stocks close, and um, and 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 kind of understanding that part of it was was definitely a learning curve, and and I think if I didn't. If I had kids at the time, like I, I was just starting that 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 chapter of my life where my wife got pregnant, maybe a, a year year or two later. Um, if I would have had kids at the time, it would have been a little bit more challenging, uh, not knowing, you know, and not knowing because I found myself uh, I found myself up at nine, ten, eleven o'clock at night mo monitoring my positions where I hadn't done that before, getting up a lot earlier than. Than before, just to be around during the European hours. So that was uh, that was like one of the big, um, I think one of the big uh, 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 challenges for me. But it was also 
a lot of fun, and it, and it, it 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 seemed like to me it provided so much more opportunity. And I'm somebody who's always been very passionate about the markets. I I love trading the markets. I I I think I'm in front of my computer probably a good 15 hours a day. Uh, and and it, even if I'm not in front of my computer, I I'm I'm running around with you know my phone watching quotes. So I'm pretty much got a beat on the market as long as I'm awake. And uh, so the, it 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 provided in my opinion a lot of opportunities too and 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 ways to take advantage of the markets that I hadn't seen before in the past. Okay, so you you brought up an interesting point there and it's actually something I wanted to ask you about your actual main trading hours. So you said you're pretty much in tune with the markets for about 15 hours a day. What are your your main trading sessions like within those fifteen hours? Are there like a few hours where you're most active? Yes, they, there are, and and one of the one of the the the, the drawbacks to living on, uh, well, I'm on West Coast hours. I don't actually live on the West Coast of the United States, but I I, I trade during West Coast hours seven months out of the year. Uh, one of the drawbacks to that is I do get up extremely early uh, because that's when the European markets are opening, and you've got. Most of the traders in New York or Toronto, uh, you know, that are really sitting down and getting in front of their computers. So, um, you know, I get up extremely early, and my 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 day is pretty busy until uh, the European markets close. Once the European markets close, uh, the day the liquidity tends to uh, to 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 to. to pair back a little bit. So my busiest time is like I, like I explained to you, when you have those overlaps, when the European markets are open and the North American markets are open and you get that, that, that New York Stock Exchange open, if you will, that is a very busy time of the market. That's, um, and it's early in the morning for me. But I, I'm a, I, I guess I'm an early morning guy and I've always have been. So it's, it, it, it kind of fits to my, my schedule. Okay. So for like a newer trader... Who, who might be listening to this right now, as someone who, who's just starting out in trading, uh, especially Forex, do you think it's a good idea for them to be tuned into the market for, let's say, you know, 15 hours a day or like not, not necessarily like sit in front of their computer glued to the screen for those 15 hours, but, you know, maybe checking their phone, checking quotes, um, seeing what price is at. Is that something that is beneficial or is that almost unhealthy or like too much <laughs> noise for someone who's just starting out? Like, is it good to have like a time where they engage with the market and then at other times when they're completely switched off from it? Yeah, yeah um, I, I think the reason why, and I, I don't want to scare anybody who's new, the, the reason why I spend so much time in front of the computer is more of a product of my, uh, what I do. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a full-time trader. I also, um, you know, I have a company called Forex Analytics where we, you know, I have a team with Nicola Duke, obviously. Uh, she's, uh, you know, we, we, we analyze the markets. We put out analysis for, for traders um, throughout the course of the day. So I, I kind of, it's been my job and with being the chief currency strategist of Wise Trade that I, I kind of have to sit in front of the computers all day and it's, it's what I do. But for somebody who's a new trader, I, I really don't think it's, it, it's, it's, so important, um, but it also depends what you're trying to do. And the the, the great thing, whether you're trading currencies or whether you're trading the markets in general, um, I think you can approach the markets different ways. You know, you can you can say, well, all right, well, I just want to be a, I just want to be an active trader. I want to kind of get in and out, uh, you know, over the course of a couple hours, and then you know, be out of every position and be done for the day. Well, then you look for those those great overlapping times. You know, whether it's where the Asian so it'd be like midday for you, like the Asian markets and the European markets where they cross over. You know, that's an active time to be in the markets. You could you could really you know be in there to you know take advantage of some quick opportunities, be in and out, and be done for the day. Um, the flip side of that is if you're if you if you work a full time job and you're like okay, well I'm just trying to tackle the markets more, you know, just try to make some extra income, then you probably are taking a more of a a longer term approach to the market or a, a position type of approach. You're going to use some more of a macro backdrop behind what you're doing. You know, I'm buying the dollar because the Federal Reserve is actively raising interest rates. Great. Okay, I'm only looking to buy the dollar. So then you look you you're looking for those. Those opportunities every few days where the dollar has pulled back 
and you're looking to, 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 to take advantage for a day or two as it pulled back and then you can buy the dollar on the cheap and then spin out of it a day or two later. You know, and, and if that's the type of approach that you're, 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 you're taking, I, don't, I really don't think you need to, you know, uh, 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 spend that much time in front of the computer looking at, you know, all the different screens. What I do like though, Aaron, and one of the things that I've learned as being a trader is I've always got I've always got some sort of position on no matter how how small it is. I've always got even like, you know, this time of the this time of the market where I know the liquidity is kind of poor. I've got I've got positions in the market that I keep open based on whatever reasoning I've got to buy or sell the currency. But I do it because it forces me to always be looking at quotes because if I'm looking at quotes, I'm always keeping a beat on the market. The markets are not like a bike. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I've, I've found this to be so true over the years of trading. It's not like a bike where you can just, you know, I haven't ridden a bike in five years and I pick up a bike and just ride. In the markets, it takes some time to get your head re-engaged back into the game. So by having a position in the market, I call it a marker. Uh, I have a position in the market. It may, I may not be making a whole lot of money. I may not be uh, uh, losing a whole lot of money. But what I'm doing is I'm forcing myself to keep an eye on prices. So this way, I'm always keeping an eye on price action. And it keeps me aware of, oh, hey, you know, the euro was just trading at 115 the other day. And now it is at 113. But we've had a real big you know, pullback just over the course of the last couple of days. Why is that? And then it forces me to find out the reasons why that pullback has occurred and and therefore I'm always engaged in the market. It's kind of like I'm riding a bike and I'm still on it. I haven't I haven't I haven't hopped off it. I'm just still I'm still kind of on it even though I might not be, you know, uh riding too quickly or being too uh too too uh too overly aggressive with my bike riding if that makes any sense. It does make sense and it, it's quite interesting. It's um so so what if you don't have a what if you don't? If there's nothing that's really like standing out to you as as a, being a good opportunity to get into the market, you still just put a a very small position on, regardless. Am I understanding that right? I always I always find something to do. There's always something. There's always something happening. In my in my opinion, there's always, especially in the currency market, there's always an overarching theme that's driving the market. So whether it's um, you know, I, I, I'm 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 extremely bearish the Kiwi, so I'm going to have some sort of Kiwi short exposure going at all times. Or I I, I think the I think the, the dollar is extremely bearish, so I want to keep some, you know, dollar dollar shorts going at all times. And then I'm I'm extremely bullish the yen right now, so I might have a small short dollar yen just to keep a. It helps me keep an eye on the market. I tend to have something running almost all the time, but that's my own. That's my own personal strategy. I don't necessarily think it's right for everybody, but it's something that I do um, because, like I said, it forces me to stay engaged in the markets. Okay. Okay. Sure. So, talk to us about those overarching themes. Um, you know, macro events, economic uh, factors. How important is it to to have a grasp on those sorts of things as a forex trader? Like, can you? Would you suggest someone trades forex? purely based on technicals and price action or economic factors and those other few things I mentioned, are they really important to, to have a grasp on too? That's, that's, a, that's also a great question. And, I, and I, feel that, I feel that having some sort of base understanding of why the markets are moving up or down is important. I really, I really do. And um, because if, you, if you're just looking at charts, it's kind of like, driving with, you know, one, one hand over your, your right eye or even with one eye closed. You, you're not seeing your periphery. You're not seeing everything around you. Um, so I think having a basic understanding of what, a dr what drives the currency market is, is good. You know, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a, you know, website called Investopedia. It's, it's such a great resource for, for, for traders, you know, no matter what instrument you're trading. Uh, I think that's a, great place to start just trying to understand what what drives you know what drives uh, individual currencies there are some you know economic events if you're not aware of them they can really alter the outcome 
of whatever you're attempting to do in the markets. And that's why it's, it's important to know, you know, what news events are coming, you know, like, you know, tomorrow, uh, for example, uh, just, I know people are going to be listening to this at different times, but tomorrow in Australia, there's a couple key events of the week that if you're not, if you're not in tune with knowing that those events are, are, are happening tomorrow morning in Australia, it could really influence, you know, what you're doing with the Australian dollar. So, um, you know, I think it's. I think there's a lot of great resources, though, that'll help educate uh, you. You know, you, the individual trader out there. So, where's a good place to be in tune with those type of events uh, that that are coming out that are scheduled uh, for release? Like, is there a website you can get all this information from? Yeah, there's a there's a few great websites. Um, first of all, I, I I think that if you're using any of the big brokers, FX brokers, uh, no matter you know who you're using in the market, they are going to have some sort of resources for you, um, whether they have their own analysis team or they, they, they contract that out to another team. They, they, they tend to offer um, some analysis and probably a, a schedule of events on their site somewhere, you know, d- depending on what broker you're using, but most of them will offer that, that type of information. Uh, one of the websites that I love to use is Forex Factory. It's a it, it they, they've they've got a forum. I, I don't read through the forums because I I don't I don't like to get caught up with what everybody else is saying about the markets. It you know I I don't like anybody influencing my my take on the market. But I I I I like to see what events are coming. And if you go to their calendar, they've got a really uh, um, intuitive calendar to use it's it's very easy for the average trader to go and look at it and say oh you know there's an important event coming up in australia or in 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 europe so that forex factory is great there's a there's also a team of traders um they have a a free site it's called forex live a wonderful uh team of traders out there I, i i i really have the most respect for all those guys behind that 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 um, that company, the guys that started it, I've, I've, I know, and I've, you know, been associated with um, for for the last several years. I've communicated a lot with those guys, and the guys that run it now are all very sharp individuals. So I have a lot of respect for them as well. And that's a it's a good place to get started. You might feel a little lost as a new trader. You might say, "Oh God, I don't really understand that." But don't worry, you know, it it, it takes time. It's not. It's not something that you know. It's it, it, it happens overnight. But the more you read and the more you learn, um, you know, the more comfortable comfortable you're going to become with uh, with with what's happening around you globally. But it is a global market, and it's important to to have a have an idea of what's happening in in each of the respective currencies and countries that you're trading. Right. Right. Okay. No. Really awesome answer, Blake. I appreciate you you sharing that with us. Sure. So one other thing I'd like to talk about while I've got you here is Forex brokers. Um, now, there's a few different things I want to ask you around the subject, but let's start with, um, actually, let's start with leverage. So, you know, as we know, many people are attracted to Forex for the huge amounts of leverage that are available. How do you use leverage and what advice would you give to less experienced traders using leverage? I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, I am the leverage is not important to me. Uh, I, I could almost trade on a cash basis, but that 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 just happens to be my situation. It's not the situation of everybody because I under, understand. Hey, you know, I'm trying to get started, and I only have a I have a small account. I, f- I f- you know I, I feel I can't I can't you know it's it's hard for me to get around in the equity markets because I need more money to buy some you know buy shares or stock. It's it's just more difficult. So they come to the forex market because of the leverage. Um, I always. I, I try not to think so much about the leverage. I try to think about the risk associated, associated with each trade. All right. So what I mean by that, Aaron, is like let's say I'm buying one lot of the, you know, the euro dollar, you know, whatever, whatever lot it is, you know, whether it's a regular lot or it's a micro lot or however your broker coins it. If you're buying a lot of the euro dollar and you say, okay, I'm gonna buy it at 111, but I only want to risk down to 110. What I always tell people is figure out, because whenever you trade, the first thing you should ask yourself before you even get into a trade is what is my risk? That's, that's, like, that's, like, that's question number one. Most people have it backwards where they say, okay, well, I'm going to buy the euro. I'm going to buy it at 111. I think it's going to 120. 
great. What's your risk? That's the first question I'm going to ask. At what point do you think you're going to be wrong? At what point do you have to pull the plug and say, all right, I need to get out of this thing? Well, if you bought it at 111 and it goes down to 110, you have to figure out how much money that's going to cost you to be wrong. And you go, okay, well, if I bought the euro at 111 and I sell it at 110, I'm just going to use easy numbers here. I'm going to risk 100 bucks. That's $100. Great. You're risking $100. Now, if you have a $1,000 account and you risk $100, you're now risking 10% of your account. I don't care what margin you had available to you. You're losing 10% of your money in one trade. That's unacceptable. Now, if you say, okay, well, I'm buying the euro at 111. I'm going to sell it at 110. If I, if I, if I, if I'm, if I take a loss, I'm going to lose hundred bucks. Well, if you had $10,000 in your account and you lose hundred dollars, now you're losing 1% of your trade. I feel personally, I feel that's more, you know, that that's more acceptable. That's within maybe somebody risk parameters. So again, it's not about the leverage. It's about what your risk is in that particular trade versus your account value that you have. Because, you know, I could take a trade of buying the euro and selling the euro, buying at 110. And if I take a risk or if I, if I take, a, take a loss in it and I, and I get out at 110, you know, that risk to me might have been a thousand bucks. And if I have a hundred grand in my account, I'm, I'm risking a percent of my trade excuse me, a percent of my account in that trade, that's acceptable risk for me. But if, if, if you only had $10,000 in your account, that's not acceptable risk. That means you have, to, you have to adjust your position size accordingly to sustain you know, the, the, whatever you, you think is appropriate risk. And I think if you, if you have that approach to your trading, Aaron, and you have reasonable you know, uh, risk parameters... And I, I say reasonable, you know, I don't think you should risk more than 1% in any one trade at any given time. That's just a, a nice rule of thumb that's very easy to remember. But I think if you stay within those type of risk parameters, it doesn't really matter how much leverage you have. You shouldn't exceed the, the, that, that, the, the leverage that the broker will give you because leverage is, as you've probably heard before, it's a double-edged sword. It can work against you in mean ways. And so if you're, if you're just, if you're mindful of the, the risk you're taking in every single trade and making sure that that risk is manageable and it's within reason, you shouldn't have a problem with the, the leverage that they give you. The, the leverage they should give you should be ample, more than ample. I don't know if that answered your question. No, it does. And it's a really good way of, of looking at it. You know, risk first over anything else. I think that that's a really good point you bring up. You also said in your answer there, and, and I think this, this leads to my next point, is if you're starting with a $1,000 account, um, oh, let me rephrase that. So it, it, it seems as though in Forex, a lot of brokers will let you open an account with a lot lower minimums. You know, I think some are maybe even 500 bucks. Uh, could be less, I'm not really sure. But you know, in your opinion, what's the absolute minimum someone should begin with as an account size? Who who is genuinely serious about trading as a career? You, you know, uh, I I don't think I can answer that question because I don't. You know, anybody who's listening to this podcast, I don't think can. You know, I I, I can I can't make a, a roundabout assumption that everybody fits this one bill, but I do think that account minimums like that that are 500 bucks or or a thousand dollars i just don't i really don't think that's realistic that it seems to me that it's more like a hobby it would be a hobby for somebody if you're really serious about trading i i really think that you should have a bigger amount in your trading account but also still managing it the same way you know uh, like maybe a five thousand dollar account or maybe a a ten thousand dollar account or maybe even a two thousand dollar account but when you start getting in the accounts less than ten thousand dollars you're you're dealing with what they call well at least a lot of brokers will call a micro account and it's great you know what it's one of the benefits of trading currencies is you can you can really you know people always say you know blake should i should i practice trade with on paper i'm like why because if you can if you can trade a micro lot and you get into a trade and you lose 50 cents or you lose a dollar you know it's it it actually you still feel the emotion whether you're whether you're making whether you're losing five dollars or whether you're losing 50 cents or you're losing five hundred dollars or five thousand dollars you still feel the emotion of that 
oh my God, I did it right or wrong. And, you know, it kind of forces you to make the good decisions, even when you're trading with such little amounts. But the, the great thing about currencies is you can really test the waters with such little amounts. Even, you know, so if, if you're really serious about it, I think you got to stay away from the minimums. And, and if you're not in that, if you're not in that camp and you say, well, I can't really, I can't really, you know, get there. Well, then you should save up to get there, you know, before you really, you know, get in the markets. And maybe in the meantime, you practice, you know, you practice on paper just so you understand the, the trading platform that you're using. Because being able to execute and knowing what you're doing when you need to do it, you know, it's like I'm getting in the euro, I'm getting out of the, the pound, I'm getting in the, the Aussie. Whatever you're, you're trading, you want to know how to execute that trade instantaneously. Uh, so it's more of second nature. So even if you're, even if you're, um, if you're like, well, I'm quite, I'm, I'm, I'm not enough, I'm not quite there to have, you know, five thousand dollars in my account, but I'm saving up. Well, in the meantime, you know, understand, you know, the macro environment. Uh, take some time and go through those websites that I, I gave you, just to, just to learn a little bit more before you're, you're, you're really putting, you know, you're putting real money uh, to use. Yeah. Now, that was a good answer, Blake. I think um, I think you got to the point I was trying to um, <laughs> trying to lead you to, even though that it probably wasn't the the best way to frame the question. But no, I, I just wanted to bring up that subject of you know these very small account minimums that are available uh, through some forex brokers, and you know still on the subject of forex brokers, it does seem as though there are you've got to be quite selective on the type of broker you go with, especially in Forex. There seems to be, you know, some, some sketchy brokers knocking about. Yeah. What should traders be wary of when selecting a broker? And what are the tells of a reputable broker? That That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, you know, so I'm going to give you just a, a real easy answer. Stick with the big names. You know, if uh, whatever the big names broker brokers are, um, th- those are the ones that you want to s- stay with because they're usually highly regulated by the, the 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 government which they reside in, whether it's in the UK or or it's in it's in the United States or or, or even in Australia. Just use a, a the biggest the biggest broker you can find. I know you know a lot of people don't want to don't want to do that because they're like oh, I just don't want to I don't use big banks I like to use a small bank but in the currency market you know you you want to make sure that your broker is being regulated pretty extensively and that's why some of the like we have a couple brokerage firms in the United States that are publicly traded companies and that means that they're extremely extremely scrutinized from a regula- regula- regulatory standpoint that does not make them immune. Um, for, from losses, because obviously, after after if you know anything about what happened with the Swiss National Bank uh, decision a couple years back, when they when they they uh, they really wrecked um, some big UK brokers, uh, but at least you know you'll you'll be more protected being with a, a big a bigger broker, in my opinion. Um, you know, some of these smaller outfits, yeah, you, you have to be a little weary. And um, I, 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 if, if I'm going to, if I'm going to, you know, put my money into a brokerage firm, it's going to be with a firm that, that is a, has a reputable name on the street. Okay. All right, Blake. Well, let's, let's wrap this up. Um, man, it's been awesome speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. I, I thank you for having me on here. I, I've 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 heard about you over the years. You do really great work, and I'm I'm honored to be a part of it. No, no trouble. Thank you. Um, where is the best place for listeners to go to find out more about you? Um, well, I, I I I'm I'm on Twitter. I'm Pipzar, and by the way, Pipzar was a, a it was a client given name. Uh, many years ago, so <laughs> I always I always have to preface people like, hey, you know, this it was a handle that uh, that that one of my clients gave me uh, years ago when when they initiated a car czar. They somebody called me the pip czar um, because I traded you know price interest points, and so that's where I, it, it came from, and it just stuck. So I, I, on on uh, Twitter, I'm at pip czar, and uh, if you go to our site. Um, Forex Analytics, and that's spelt uh, analytics with an X at the end. 
not like CS, it'd be X. Uh, myself and uh, several other team members, we provide analysis throughout the course of the day, and um, and and you can you can see our blog there. It's it, we have a lot of write-ups on different exotic currencies and crosses and and whatnot, and and also. Um, I am the chief currency strategist at the Wise Trade Group, and that means that I host webinars throughout the course of the day. So if you if you uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, every once in a while I'll send out a link where you can log in and listen in, and and it's it's free. Uh, I don't, it's not not a sales thing. I three and a half hours a day of just basically analyzing the markets and and answering questions from individual traders like yourselves, and uh, we talk about what's moving, and that's that's uh, you know we cut through all the. The uh, financial, the financial uh, TV show crap, where it's just it's us, what's moving and what's not, and let's take a look at it. So, excellent. And I should probably just mention your Twitter handle is spelt P I P C Z A R. That's correct, isn't it? That's correct. Yeah, P I P C Z A R. Correct. Good one. So, go follow Blake on Twitter. And once again, Blake, I hugely appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks for having me, Aaron. It was a lot of fun. I can't believe how fast time flew by. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders. 